Okay, we will get started. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang, uh, selamat sore actually. Uh, selamat sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Shalom. Uh, salam kebajikan. Uh, welcome to everybody to the Indonesia Education Forum's 12th Roundtable. Uh, this is a thought leadership forum. Uh, we do this every month. Sometimes there are more than one in a month. And we've been doing this for the last two years now. Uh, the whole idea of the Education Roundtable is uh, to focus in global aspects of education because there are many events happening in Indonesia already, but they are mostly in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, our program is in English so that we can bring a global audience together. We also have people from other countries. For example, today we have people who are connected from UNICEF, we are connected from World Bank, we are connected from various organizations. And there's a chance for us to uh, discuss more about uh, education initiatives in Indonesia and how we all can play a role. So first of all, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, we all have some fantastic speakers today. Uh, before I introduce them, I'd like to just tell a few um, housekeeping points. Uh, firstly, uh, this session is being recorded because as you know, we restrict the number of people in a round table to only 30 to 40. Maximum allowed is 60 in case there is a youth participation, then we allow students to join. And uh, the reason to do that is so that we can have a good Q&A, we can have a good uh, discussion. But the recording of this will be available to the public on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. So that will be available after two days. Uh, however, the conversation here is kept to a small group so that you can have a chance at questions, uh, asking, you know, giving some of your feedback, etc. So this is a good participative format for the roundtable. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, the format is quite open. We have some presentations, some are discussions, some are chat, some are fireside chat. So we, we mix it up so that it's not uh, boring for anyone and it, we are able to, you know, uh, keep a lively format, which uh, you can be easy to follow. Uh, the rundown for today will be, we have four speakers uh, and uh, the four speakers will be allocated their time slots uh, between 30 to 45 minutes. Of the main speakers, of course, will be in 45 minutes. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the last 10-15 minutes. So if you have any questions, there are two ways to participate. One is you put your hand up and we'll ask you to come onto the screen, uh, put on your video and ask a question. Please put on your video and ask a question when you're doing that. Or if you would like to just put your question in the chat box, then I'm your moderator. I'll read out your question and I'll be able to uh, uh, discuss uh, the uh, the question that you have and ask with the people. So I just want to check, is everybody able to hear me? If one or two people can just say yes. I think there's a message in the chat. Yes, yes, we can hear yes, you. you. Oh, okay, yes, perfect. Yes, yes. And uh, if you're not able to hear, maybe you'll have to just check your audio system. I think there's one person who's just texted in the uh, chat box, they're not able to hear. Please check your audio connection. You have to connect to audio. Uh, that is one. Okay, so uh, today, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, we have here with us, and we are very honored to have Pavikan Sakarinto, who is our Dirjan of Education. Uh, Pavikan has been spearheading the transformation of the skills sector, especially to the vocational schools. I have the honor of knowing Pavikan for the last one and a half to two years, and uh, we have he has been a speaker at the Education Forum, the Economic Forum, and many other things. He has widely shared his great ideas and plans, which now are reality. So you'll know that they were proposals two years ago, and today they are real. They are actually, the programs are happening. Uh, I must say with great pride that the team at the Ministry of Education is one of the most dynamic teams I've ever seen. Starting from Mas Mantri, Panadin Makarim, to all the Director Generals, this team means business, they're doing things, they're creating uh, history, not only for Indonesia, but around the region, because Indonesia is the fourth largest education market in the world. Fourth largest. There are 500,000 plus schools and almost 5 million uh, teachers and more than 50 million students. It's large. After China, India, US, Indonesia is number four. It's huge. 
and the challenge is Indonesia is transforming itself into a modern education system and Indonesia is getting ready for industry 4.0. Indonesia is also affected by the pandemic which has changed the way we are uh, carrying out education in the system. And with all these transformations, I think Pavikan has been at the center of all the action and doing very interesting and very exciting things which are being noticed all around the world. So this is not just a story of Indonesia. This is a story of Indonesia in the world. And I'm very uh, proud and happy that Pavikan has accepted my invitation to be here today. And he will be uh, having a 45 minute session with us, which is a combination of a presentation, a chat and a Q&A. But before I, uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to welcome Pa Vikan. Pa Vikan, thank you for being here today. Yeah. Thank you, Pa Sajin. Yes. So Dr. before we continue with Pa Vikan, I'm going to just tell you about the other speakers and then we'll jump right into with Pa Vikan. We have Karan Khemka, who will be logging in soon. Karan is a speaker uh, with vast experience. They are from a very large investment fund across the globe. And they're investing in uh, education businesses across the globe in many countries, almost 40 countries. And they're building an ecosystem around companies that can work together and education institutions that can work together. And Karan will be telling us a little bit about what's happening in other parts of the world. And he'll be here today. Then we have uh, Pa Franciscus Leonardus from Intel, who is going to talk about innovative solutions that are in the market. Intel is also a sponsor of the Education Forum. We thank them for that. And they have been a fantastic supporter all these years. And last is the Food for Thought, which I think all of you have been enjoying, is Panalin uh, Singh, who is the CEO of Orbit Future Academy, who always likes to give us an alternative perspective, how we can start thinking about education in a different way. So Panalin is talking about some issues related to the pandemic and some very interesting findings, which I think you won't find elsewhere. So without... So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Pavi Khan and uh, we'll get started right away. So Pavi Khan, welcome to Education Forum once again. Thank you, Pav, for being here. Thank you. So, well, thank you very much, Pa Sachin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom. Om Swastiastu Namo Buddhaya. Salam Kebajikan. And very warm good afternoon to all ladies and gentlemen. So thank you very much, Pak Sachin, for having me. Uh, yes, Pak. So I can share what we've been doing uh, and what's the challenge and uh, what's the difficulties. And I would not, but I won't say that it's easy. It's it's difficult to transform the human resource in Indonesia. So let me just uh, show some slides. Please, because I I expect more in discussions so yes. maybe i will just uh okay so um we all know that uh, when we talk about vocational education so it has to do with million students and millions students in smk and also million students in higher education or so maybe in polytechnics university and etc so it yeah covers more than 2,000 campuses, more than 14,000 SMKs, and even more, 17,000 of training centers in Indonesia. So it's about, yeah, it's, I think it's more than five or six million uh, students. We talk about it. So if we can improve, if we can uh, make it so much fine, the link and match between vocational schools, and industries, we can imagine the big of chance or the big of impact that we can create to Indonesia. And we know that everybody expect vocational education since the Director General of Vocational Education has been established nearly two years ago. Everyone expect, and even higher than before, that a vocational can soon produce uh, human resource with uh, good competence and strong uh, characters. So our president always expect about this. Human resource development, such as vocational training and vocational internships abroad should be carried out on the large scale. He said that in 2019, bringing mentors from other countries, from industries in the large scales 
to mentor both teachers and students. He mentioned that in also 2019. Lectures are not only local teachers, but also come from foreign teachers, come from industry. So etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can ex we can uh, we can see that the expectation is even higher than before. So we uh, try to uh, to understand uh, our president instructions, people expectations to be this uh, policy. What so called is 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 it's simple link and match, link and match, not only MOU signing, taking photograph and put in your newspapers that is not link and match link and match yeah. at least should cover these eight aspects curriculums should be synchronized and should be developed together with the industries not only uh, not only sitting together but collect curriculum from industries curriculum training from uh, profession association and put together into our curriculum so that's one thing. Number two is project-based learning. Not project-project and based learning, but it should be a real <laughs> project from industry, from the market, bring into the class since the early phase of study, study of our students. So they learn their material by doing and by uh, accomplishing the project. And if the results doesn't satisfy the industry or the customer, then they cannot pass. The students cannot pass the lectures or the the, the program. So this means that lear uh, learning to swim by uh, enter the sea. So project-based learning and also curriculum. Number three is that bring the teachers from industries at least 50 hours per semester, per program, minimally, 100 hours minimum I expect actually. So we, we teach them not only by us, but also real, uh, ex, uh, real professional experts from industry and teach the, the students. So it means like cooking. So we develop, we define together what kind of food that we will cook. And then we make the recipe together. And also, and then we cook together by teaching them together. Internship at least one semester. Certificate of competence should be developed uh, within the curriculum and should be uh, acknowledged by industry. So it's not only paper, but it's really certificate to acknowledge the competence and acknowledge by an industry. Training by industry for teachers. And applied research should come from the real case from industry. So research of vocational uh, teachers or lectures should not only come up with paper, but should be coming up with a real product. So don't even think the mindsets only to create the paper to get promoted as a professor, but without product. That is not vocational. That is not applied research. So number eight is commitment to absorb. It's not a must but commitment to absorb the graduates. So these eight aspects, Mr. Sachin and ladies and gentlemen, it's easy to say, it's, it's, it's like, well, I'm, I'm more and more convenient to explain these eight aspects from day to day, because I've been talking about this more than hundred times. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of easy to say, but the challenge is that the mindset of our human resource, the mindset of the teachers, will are they willing to change their mindset to, to teach not only filling the students but instead to empower the students to be independently uh, long uh, to study for the rest of their life with their passions with their minds uh, with their visions so they know why they are uh, being smk students or vocational students they understand that, they're aware that, and they know in the next five or 10 years what they're going to be or what profession they will be uh, in the future. So that is the most important thing. The challenge is that yeah. it's not easy to develop the mindset of our teachers, something like this. So if we invest millions or maybe trillions 
billions, millions, trillions of rupees. We invest to SMK or to vocational campus without uh, defining the mindset and character of the teachers or the leaders there. So it's not, it's, it's, it's just come up with uh, building and tools, but then the graduate doesn't fit the industry need. So physical development for me is number two or number three or number four or I don't know. But number one is should be the mindset of the character of the teacher. So number one should be it's like uh, the soil if, if 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 it is get fertilized, meaning the mindset and character we can uh, really uh, manage that they 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 really open mind. They really know how to understand and to implement this uh, policy and they know uh, the uh, teachers not only to teach but sometimes they have to be able to be the mentor or facilitator because project-based learning teachers act as a facilitator not as a teacher and then sometimes they can be the coach like this i'm sorry Everyone who doesn't cheer for Manchester United, I'm sorry if you are <laughs> Liverpool fans. Congratulations after almost 30 years, <laughs> finally <laughs> trophy come back to uh, Liverpool. So this coach doesn't teach this. Instead, he empower or he make these young students, these young fellows, uh, to to understand and to love their vision, and then independently he can train by them. He can he he trained themselves, he studied by themselves independently. But, and then he know uh, the directions that he's going to, uh, to go on. So sometimes to be the coach, and sometimes to be friends or parents, and sometimes bros, brother and sisters. So this is the teacher's uh, ability that I would like to see uh, now and forever. So success factors affected by 80% humans. And only 20% by design, roadmap, policy, strategies, machines, infrastructures, facilities. Maximally, it's about 20% to affect the success factors. 80% because of humans. So we invest a lot of money for this slide. We invest hundreds of hundred. Jadi 200 miliar. Uh, we invest a lot of money to to really implement this strategy. So we train more than 30,000 teachers and principals of SMK in Indonesia for leadership, mindset change, uh, productive competence, and etc. Together with industries. So we invest a lot of money to. Uh, to produce or to change the mindset of our teachers. And last but not least, last but not least, um, this is the policy that we implement now. Vocational education start from SMK, three years, and they can go to Diplom 2, Diplom 3, and Diplom 4. But our policy is that we want to upgrade all Diplom 3 become Diplom 4 or Applied Bachelors. But it's not a mandatory, but we really push, we really, 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 really push and expect to see that many, many Diplom 3 programs upgraded into Applied Bachelor or Sajana Terapan. And SMK, we connect with Polytechnic by uh, implementing the program what's so-called SMK Diplom 2 Fast Track. SMK combined, SMK three years, SMK of three years combined with Diplom two, but fast track, not four semester, but three semesters. And the three semesters in Diplom two, within the Diplom two, only one semester, the students just go to the campus and sit in the class or maybe working, uh, learning, working with the machines in the laboratory. The other two semesters, they have to go to industry for internship and training in the industries. It's like the combination of the Japanese system and German system. In Japan, vocational high schools, 
of five years. Here we make it four and a half years, and the last three semesters, sorry, and the last two semesters, we apply what German what uh, German uh, people applied in vocational industry there, what so called dual system. Yeah. So doing internship industry and also uh, should be undergoing uh, the training. They should follow the training. So maybe within a week, five days, three and a half days uh, working and learning for industries and one and a half days, uh, they should uh, follow the training in industries. And since from the first grade, there are three types of teachers. First is teachers of SMK, second is teachers of polytechnics, and number three is teachers of, of industries, from industry. So it's like triangle marriage. SMK, Polytechnics, and Industries with this uh, policy. Uh, Pak Sachin, I think that's all. Actually, there is another one, the research. Yeah. This is the roadmap of the research. So it should start from the end, start from what a real case from industry. So do not have, shouldn't have, uh, our lecture or our researchers should not have the mindset of uh, research, uh, conducting research is just only to publish uh, yeah. paper, and then to just to get the promotion to professor. It's not wrong, it's not wrong. But anyway, it should be uh, uh, research, vocational research, applied research should be uh, coming up with real product, real product. So maybe uh, that's all my short presentation, Pak Sachin. Anyway, what is the most challenging is that or the most difficulty, difficult uh, things is, is to Pains or to upgrade or to improve the mindset of the teachers, lecturers, principals, deans, and etc. Yeah, that's the most difficult things. So they really know what link and match is, and what should do when they declare. Okay, I'm already linked, and I, and we already provide graduate that match with industries. But anyway, the new curriculum we are about to deploy, the new curriculum. Which more into soft skills and characters, not so much on hard skills. Hard skills is also important, but the base, the platform is soft skills and character. So we need teachers, we need lecturers who really know how to deliver material, learning material, but uh, with uh, uh, strengthening uh, character and soft skills. So on top of that, hard skills will. Uh, will be improved uh, 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 along with uh, their career. So I think that's all. Yeah. Uh, back to you, Pak Sachin. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum yeah. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah. Thank you, Pak Vikan. First of all, uh, I have to congratulate you. That is such a well presented, um, uh, you know, I, articulation of the idea of what you're doing. Uh, I think in your slides it comes out very clearly. There is a master plan. That is the most important thing. Because if there is a master plan, people will know what to do, where to do, how to participate. And you mentioned a very important word, pa, link and match. I want to ask you a few questions about that. Uh, at the moment, uh, with the link and match that you have proposed since I think now about a year ago, uh, what has been the response of the industry? Uh, could you say a few words about what type of companies are joining in? What is the kind of participation? Is it only big companies? Are there small companies, medium sector? What has been your experience so far, pa? Yeah, thank, thank you for the questions. Actually, maybe I would like to come back to my slides. Um, I mentioned about this year, we train more than 30,000 30, teachers and uh, principals. Yeah. We train with more than 260 industries. Oh, wow. Officially, officially, because after the trainings for maybe 50 or 60 uh, hours of yeah. trainings, they will go to industry and then they are doing, the teachers will do uh, internship program in industries. So that pictures, uh, maybe I can tell that there are, uh, there are more more industries. When we introduce this concept, they understand that, okay, let's cook together. Mm -hmm. But maybe at first, when they jump into number eight, why should we absorb your graduates? We yeah. don't even know your graduates are, and we don't even know what they study 
in your university. So this come back to the mindset of the principal and the deans or director of polytechnic. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they go to industry. They come to visit industry directly. Jump into number four. Okay. Um, we are. Um, Uh, we are wondering, can we send our students to do internship in your company without speaking about the curriculum at first, without <laughs> explaining this? Some work and some doesn't work out. Yeah. So again and again, it, it comes back to the mindset. But coming back into the questions, when we completely explain about this concept, most of industry, they can understand. Because number eight is not a must. Yeah. Please, if one up to seven things have been done, then why don't you absorb when you need and then when you find it's fine, uh, the the graduate fine to your uh, standard. So please accept. I, okay, of course, why not? Because we already cook together. <laughs> yeah. And then we know already from internship and etc. So that's the experience. Most of them they can accept, yeah. and more and more industries are willing to work with us. Not only big industries, not only UMKM, smart, uh, small, medium, yeah. and also government office, NGO, yeah. are also the target of the link and match. Fantastic, pa. So that's I'm glad to hear that you're having a wide range of participant uh, companies working with you. So, do you have any priority sectors you believe that are more important than other sectors? Is there any plan like that, or what are you seeing, Pa? What is your experience, and what type of companies, what sectors are more yeah. participative today? Actually, we officially match what we are doing now to supply and the demand side from the companies, the Ministry of Industry, the Ministry of uh, uh, Worker, and etc. So we fine tune supply and demand and then officially we have uh, yes we do have some priorities in terms of the sectors of course first is manufacturing and uh, manufacturing constructions secondly creative industry yeah thirdly hospitality and uh, tourism number four caregiver because we would like to send Mm. Uh, our graduates to a foreign country to abroad. Yeah, yeah. Not actually, not only caregiver. We we would like also to send uh, our graduates from engineering for computer creative industry also to abroad. Mm -hmm. So that's number five. I would say the uh, uh, collaboration with uh, link. Sorry. Uh, yeah, collaboration with. Uh, foreign uh, partners. Okay. Maritime, energy, and agriculture. So those are, and also some sectors that are really affected by Industry 4.0 uh, yes. disrupt disruptions. So pa, let's let's say four years from now because your program starts you know three years in SMK and then it goes to university right and, and to the so you're looking at between five to seven to eight years kind of a, a journey for a student. So uh, uh, what what are the sectors you believe uh, Indonesia should look at in the next two three years because they are new. I Means today maybe there is no job today but maybe in the three or four years the jobs will be there. So maybe industry can start thinking of preparing for the future working with you mm -hmm. on some new sectors. Yeah, I, I, thank you, thank you. Uh, I told you that we are about to implement the new curriculum. Actually, yes. we are implementing the new curriculum in SMK, but only two 900 SMK, what so-called SMK Center of Excellence. Yeah, that's yes. for the the pilot project. 900 SMK of Center of Excellence. Okay. We are applying this year the new curriculum. Okay. Within the new curriculum, we kind of reform. <laughs> Yeah, kind of reform the teaching materials. I told you, yeah. mindset, characters, and uh, character uh, and soft skills should yeah. come first in the early phase of study. Correct. That's one thing. Next thing is that we apply the mandatory, the new, the new mandatory uh, 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 material mm -hmm. uh, is informatics or digital technology. Yeah. 
all SMKs, kuliner, uh, engineering, uh, forestry, agriculture, all of those should apply what so called digital technology. And within the digital technology materials, of course, we can teach them or we can make them to learn about e commerce. Yeah. AI, big data, maybe blockchain to some extent, cryptocurrency, etc. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and But also all... we apply also what so called project based learning, free semesters. Okay, so this is very good part. So the uh, new curriculum is really upgraded. That's a uh, fantastic to hear. We'll be very interested yeah, to you know. But, but we need yeah. we need to see the teacher should change their mindset. <laughs> yeah. So That's it's a process. Tough. I understand it's a process. It might take two, three years, but the important thing is you have a plan. That is the. I hope so. Yes, pa. So I have another question for you, pa. You know, this uh, big challenge in Indonesia is the fact that we have 34 provinces, and it's across from Sam uh, uh, Sabang to Merauke. You see three time zones, so many different uh, cultures, so many different kind of people. Opportunities are different. In your in your experience, do you see? skills training being adopted faster in certain parts of the country or is it uniform or are there some uh, uh, spots where you think more effort should go how is your view of the uniformity of this work? yeah if, of course it differs it differs it's 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 not it's not the same when it, when we talk about smk of for example mechanical engineering yeah. smk of mechanical engineering in jakarta in batam could be the same because there are a lot of industry there but with if we if we if we talk about mechanical engineering of smk in maluku yeah of course it's not the same mechanical engineering in maluku maybe it's more into uh, the uh, maritime more into uh, how to mm -hmm. uh, upgrade the quality of fishing mm -hmm. so It's different. Maybe in Nusa Tenggara Timur, it's more into agriculture. Mm -hmm. So mechanical engineering, same name of SMK, but of course it's different. Yeah. So you do see that there is a difference in the adaptability from students. How is the students reacting? What is the reaction from the students? Yeah. Anyway, we implement. We just implement the new curriculum this year. So yeah, yeah we need a little more time to yeah. uh, to check it up how it works but when we see when when i when i saw the face of the teachers or the principals yeah. when i explained the curriculum yeah <laughs> um they they always smiling <laughs> uh, i i, I saw more yeah. optimistic uh, uh, way way of way of uh, life when they ah this is exactly what we expect because the former curriculum it's too strict It's yeah. too technical. It's just to just to produce uh, tukang, yes, yes. technician. Yeah. <laughs> But I disagree. I disagree. SMK, even though SMK should produce the 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 future leader, but who are able to make uh, sorry to work as a technicians. Yeah. Should be the future entrepreneurs. I agree, Pa. So that brings me to the next question, which is about uh, job creator. Because you know we have job seeker and we have job creator, and I think the focus of education system is to create more job seeker. But you I mentioned entrepreneurship. Be. You talked about entrepreneurship. What are you doing there so that all these people in vocational schools can become, you know, start small industry in their local areas? Because that will really help to grow Indonesia. Exactly. Yeah. It, What yeah, is the steps you are doing, Pa? Yeah. Curriculum is the first thing. Yeah. Within the curriculum, project-based learning, soft yeah. skills, characters. I think that's the base. Number yeah. two is project-based learning. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I just come back to to this slide. First is curriculum. I told you, yes. I yeah. told you, and also project-based learning. Yeah. And then this one. Applied, Applied research, research to yeah, come up yeah. with the real product. So teaching factory and whatever teaching industry programs. Uh, With the platform of a pet research, yeah. When we, when we ask the students to, to uh, participate on our project, it yeah. means that they could be, uh, they could be establishing new startup when they 
complete their program within our teaching factory mm -hmm. and they already know the customers and they already know the product is and they already know what's the level of the product expected by industry yeah. so they already know everything they already know yeah, a lot of things and then when they graduate they can just for example uh edutel in smk uh, pariwisata uh, uh, uh tourism sorry tourism yeah. tourism smk Normally they have a hotel, education hotel. So yeah. they should not just learn how to serve the guests as a front office or working in the restaurant. Okay, that's kind of fine for the first phase of study. But in the next phase, maybe in the the in the class of eleven or class of twelve, yeah, they should develop. A tourism program and promote and sell into all people in Indonesia, maybe all people in the world, invite them and then, yeah, ent ent entertain them, serve them, uh, anything. So when they graduate, they can continue. Yes, so there's continuity. They, That's important. Yeah, they point. can continue to uh, establish the startup with the same project. Same so way. is entrepreneurship part of your new curriculum? Is there exactly. Is already there exactly project based learning and entrepreneurship that is the new mandatory material three semester project based good. learning and entrepreneurship yeah so pa i have a question for you on the job side now i want to talk a little bit about you know when you finally the outcome of what you're doing is number of people who get placement and get into jobs right because end of the day it has to create yeah, jobs. of course of course of course how do you measure this part do you have any system in place which keeps a track of it so every year you know the progress what are the how are the metrics established for this yeah, yeah actually that is the official metrics that we have to achieve officially that's official official metrics b m or w b means pekerja okay m b <laughs> <laughs> B means bekerja. M means melanjutkan studi or pursuing the further study. Huh. We, not we, we, W, yeah. wira usaha. Okay. Wira usaha, entrepreneurs. BMW, that's yeah. our target and that is the official matrix. Okay. So as for the uh, 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 B, uh, working. Yeah. Uh, we can we can use no sorry for working and entrepreneurship we can use the sakernas from PPS okay. statistic uh, center uh, board of Indonesia and for pursuing uh, for the study of course we can see the data from uh, PD Dikti. okay so we we do have the official matrix PMV yeah. it's it starts from the end. Yes. It's useless if we, <laughs> if we so can accomplish BMW. Has there been any effect of the pandemic so far on this? Or how how do you see what has happened in the last two years? What is your last, experience? Yeah. In the last, okay. In When we compare to situation in 2019, of course, it decreased. Yeah. No, sorry, sorry. It increased in terms of the unemployment rate. Yeah. But if we compare to 2020, of course, it decreased. So it's like the rate of employment increase from 19 to 20, quite dramatical, but drop quite significant. No, yeah, quite quite fine, not not significant here. So we, of course, in the last one year, it gets better. But when we compare to 2019, of course, we have to work harder to uh, to come back to the situation before COVID-19. But you're definitely seeing that there is a upward trend, right? That's what you see. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I see that. I I can say, yes, we are going on that way. Uh, we are going to that direction. Yeah. So, Pavikan, do you have any recognition programs for, you know, students who are doing well or campuses doing well? Uh, are there any such kind of programs that you are planning uh, so that the public can get a little bit more information about, you know, these are the best startups or these are the best students or teachers is there anything like that that you plan? actually yeah of course we do have a lot of programs that we are for example campus merdeka yes campus merdeka provide eight types of programs like uh, community empowerment entrepreneurships internships teaching yes. in the schools 
at least one semester up to three semesters and then one semester will be acknowledged with 20 credits for example that that's what so called merdeka belajar kampus merdeka mm -hmm. and then we also uh yeah we also provide some other programs we send uh students to abroad for internship so international internships also we uh we uh develop with hung hungary Hungary, Hungary, mm -hmm. uh, Japan, Korea. Yeah. Now we are sending to those uh, uh, countries, and then we, we but we prepare. We 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 already prepare before with the uh, language trainings, and um, yeah, makang per certificate. Um, uh, sorry, in in English, uh, uh, certificate internship. Internship, yes. Yeah, internship to industries that those that we have prepared completely mm -hmm. uh, and then the students when they do internship in those companies that we have uh, chosen we uh, we provide a uh, slight salary supported by lpdp okay so actually there are a lot of programs initiatives uh, already yes so yeah, you, know, I, you mentioned a lot of programs with other countries. So I do you have any programs uh, of sending students from here to other countries like maybe India or uh, Korea or you know some of these other countries where they have a similar vocational based uh, task for uh, uh, workforce? Yeah, we are sending now. We are sending now to to Hungary. Okay. How, how to say in English? Hungary. 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 Yeah, Hungary. Hungary. Yes. Hungary. Yeah, Hungary to Korea and to Japan and we expect soon to Germany we already signed the MOU and then we already work with the embassy there our mm -hmm. our ambassador there yeah so yeah I, I I really I really want to see our some of our students can minutes to go abroad yes uh, in the future pa, you 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 have you know uh, I've seen that the way you put your programs together um, well some people say it's ambitious i think the program yeah. is very solid it's solid now it's a matter of execution which might take one or two years to fall in place but it's all happening i can see that things are already happening on the way so is there any personal goal from your side pa? what is it that you personally want to achieve during your <laughs> tenure at uh, as dirjan um i will definitely come back to changing the mindset of our teachers but before that, actually, I expect to. Uh, I, I really want to to connect this program with other ministries. Okay. With Kadin, Apindo, Himpunan Kawasan Industri Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, many many associations, uh, so we can set up what so called national board of vocational so if we can have this kind of board vocational board in the national level and supported by uh, other ministries and uh, of course the ministers as well and maybe the president can be the the head of the the board yeah then i think uh there will be more um yeah of course there will be more flowing this yeah. uh change uh ambitions i would say if you say to me i'm ambitious yeah I'm, i am no no and, i agree and of course and of course i should come back to changing the mindset improving the mindset of the human resource teachers principals deans like so, correct so pavikan if you were to say scale of one to ten where one is the beginning and ten is the end goal where do you think you are what is your view uh, maybe around five or six now currently okay and you yeah. think uh, you would like to get to seven or eight in what is it two years three years what is your view we're just trying to understand you know the yeah challenge. yeah maybe i would say maybe german system or the things the vocational situation in germany maybe it's like eight or nine or maybe mm -hmm. nine point five or nine mm -hmm. if within Three years from now, three years from now, if if I can upgrade into nearly seven, I think the impact for our nation will be quite definite, quite significant. 
Yeah. Nearly seven in three years. But it's the, the whole, see, the whole, not only the, not only the, the, the physical improvement, but also the, the mindsets, the link and match, mm -hmm. the acceptance of industries, the people mindset toward in vocational education. That's also one thing. That's also one thing. People mindset, people perception towards vocational education. So seven in a whole, I'm sure will make an, quite uh, a, a serious impact for our nation. No, I fully agree, Pa. And I, I think we, everybody here wants to support you and be part of what you're starting because what you talk about today is actually a Grakan. It's a national Grakan <laughs> that is coming together. And uh, I think there's a lot of pride in Indonesian people wanting to be part of something that will build the nation. So I really commend you for that, Pa. It's a fantastic uh, vision. I actually, you know, had some... Uh, a lot of uh, questions have been coming through on the questions. I'm going to... Uh, actually probably ask one of the speakers if there's anything. So Nalin, you are going to be a speaker. You're talking about pandemic. Would you have a question for Pavikan? Yes. So the, one of the things that has consistently amazed me in a positive way uh, from the MOEC over the last three years is their focus on not just the hard skills, but things like compassion, empathy, leadership skills, life skills, that kind of thinking. And then ingraining that in the campus Merdeka program. I haven't seen uh, anywhere else. So, the, uh, you know, many people, whenever government does something, tend to be cynical and skeptical. Oh, this is such a big program. Will you ever get it done, et cetera, et cetera. But the main thing is that having seen so many countries uh, on the education front, similarly placed on a skill level, the thinking is there. The intent is there. And slowly the movement has come we are part of the campus Merdeka program. And yes, there are a lot of issues in launching it. But if you see the enthusiasm of the teachers, the students, and even from the ministry side, it is amazing. I have often commented about this, that last time when we had uh, the holiday season and the country generally shuts down for one week, we had people from the ministry working there till midnight and calling us and pushing us to work. So I haven't seen this kind of enthusiasm, this kind of program uh, anywhere it will pay results and people will see it coming through. My question to uh, Pavikan was, the programs you're running on the vocational side, are these only for students or do you also accept some young professionals who want to reskill themselves or upskill themselves? <clears throat> oh, yeah. yeah, of course, um, number six of my Ling and Maths, eight plus I, number six, is to regularly train and upgrade the competence and skills of the teachers and also the lecturers. And more, even more, we should uh, make our teachers at least one in four or five years, they should go to industry to do the internship okay. for four or five months to upgrade their mindset and upgrade their competence. Fantastic. That's great. So, Pavikan, we already have here uh, pa Karan Kemka, who's our next speaker, but I think pa Karan wants to say something to you and maybe ask you a question. So, Karan, welcome. Uh, uh, I believe you're in Bali, right? Yes, I live in Bali. Yeah, fantastic. So, Karan is, uh, uh, you know, we are very honored to have Karan as one of our speakers today. But before we go into that, I thought we can have a bit of a conversation. Uh, 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 Avikan Chakarinto is the Director General of Vocational Education and he has just shared with us a phenomenal plan that the government is in the process of implementing. So, and uh, Karan is actually also has a lot of experience, Avikan, in this space in other countries. So, maybe a few words from you, Karan, or maybe some observations or even if you have a question to Pavikan, please go ahead. I guess my question is, you know, one of the challenges that I've seen in vocational training in developing countries, not in developed countries like Germany or in Europe, but in developing countries is that often vocational training is sort of uh, perceived to have a very low social value or prestige. So people want to avoid it. And sometimes people try to go get a degree, even when it's not the right thing for them even when the degree is going to be worthless because it's not from a great university or they're not going to do well. What are the things that, that you have planned to 
make a vocational training a more uh, desirable path for the right people okay um okay thanks so first thing is this link and match to link all the vocational schools with industries with the the, the whole scheme this to be implemented and secondly this scheme of study so imagine here is the there is a students from junior high schools they are maybe he is or she is considering uh, am I going to be fine if I choose vocational education for my uh, future? Okay, this. When they choose this scheme, after two years, they can go to job, uh, mm -hmm. to work, or they can continue to apply bachelors or to up to master degree. Mm. So if they choose this, this path, or maybe this one, SMK Diploma to Fast Track. They, it's like the marriage of SMK, campus and industry. So it's triangle, triangle marriage. It's set up by three, uh, three combinations. When they choose to school to this uh, path, after two years, they can go to job or they can continue to Diploma to only three semesters. So this is why so-called fast track. And if they continue to apply bachelors, they can jump into semester of five or fifth semester with mm -hmm. a rec recognition of prior knowledge programs. So we also provide this program. And only two years, they can get their bachelor degree. Fine. In the well-known university also or and then they can go to master degree so by means of this scheme students uh, and their parents just choose the study path based on your passions mm. if your passion is more into analytical just go into academic if your passion is more into hands-on why don't you choose vocationals you can go you can put a uh, portion your study up to master degree or maybe phd so yeah you know that I, I i thank you for your response i just remember you know in singapore they have the vocational institute in training institutes they're called ite and um, mm. the joke in schools in singapore is if you go to ite it's the end you know, <laughs> so no, no, it's so not it's the, this, yeah. it's this oh, yeah. kind of perception that you want to fight. I, that's all. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot to tell you. I forgot to tell you. I, uh, when I was graduate from high school, I did not manage. I did not manage to be uh, to enter the S one bachelor mm. programs in Gajah Mada University. So yeah. I had to go uh, to Diploma Three program. So that's that's I I I agree. It's that going to be the end if Diploma Three. So all Diploma Three. Now we are upgrading into applied bachelors. Understood. And excellent. And and the empty space left by Diploma Three, we strengthen the diploma to this diploma to and also diploma to here got it yeah uh, jobs like chef uh, tech, uh, vehicle technician um, uh, front office food and beverage if they are graduate from diploma three it's too long so why don't just three semester here only one semester study in the polytechnic and the rest to semester internship so it's mm. so quick excellent thank exactly you exactly what i expect thank you so pavikan actually you know uh, you addressed a important point with the question that karan had is about the acceptability of students and i think your answer is in the job professions if they are interested in those professions your pathway is quite good you're giving them a pathway to a proper certification applied bachelors and you know all the way to the end of that scale which is fantastic 
and uh, i think you know um, a lot a large part of this is answered by having good policies if you have a good policy in place to start with yeah. a starting point is having a good policy framework exactly exactly yeah. and once you have yeah, a yeah. policy framework everybody can come around and figure out how exactly. to fix exactly. it how to work on it but the framework has to be strong this is what i like about what you're doing your framework yeah, exactly. is quite yeah. very well defined oh now we are working on uh, improving many policies yeah. peraturan menteri peraturan presiden undang-undang we are working on that so it's it's kind of yeah. tiring but we have to provide I understand. in fact you know one of the things when i was trying to get pa we can't to be the speaker today was uh, finding the right time slot because you know it's <laughs> everybody's busy this is one of the busiest government uh, ministries in indonesia right now uh, the this ministry of education i think is uh, quite frankly speaking overloaded on top of it there's pandemic and so many other things but you have so much to do and i really admire the way you covered so much ground in the in the last two years and i'm not saying that as a, in a just you know because you are here as a speaker but i've been here 24 years pa i've seen ministry of education i've worked with ministry of education from 24 years ago till today pa and i've seen so many different dirjans i've so many different ministers and i think what you have achieved today is the real transformation in preparation for the future world because this should have happened 5 years ago actually this kind of a change should have technically started 5 years ago but you have started 2 years ago and you've come so much so far already so i think it's a good opportunity and uh, especially because the industry is involved that is what is unique about this like nalin actually said this that uh, seeing this kind of involvement by the sectors the industries the state owned enterprises the organizations uh, that level of in- interaction has not been seen earlier or is seen rarely in many other countries so i think this is a indication that indonesia wants to change and everybody wants to play a role in being a part of something that you believe is a national goal and that level of gerakan or national movement is what is fueling this you know it's not just the government doing it but it's everybody yeah. wanting to put their hands together and say how can we work and solve this because end of the day pa it is jobs for everybody and it's everybody's children everybody's uh, you know brothers and sisters it's these are the it's, it's such a basic need applicable at such a low level of you know at the basic level of your household everybody wants to do something here so i think you know pa i think we i, I understand pa we can you have to go at 4 o'clock you have another meeting so i'm going to definitely firstly thank you for being here and sharing your insights thank you very and, much and i would also like to invite you once in 6 months pa we can because there are updates and new things are happening if you don't mind every 6 yes. months yes. if you can be with us as one of our key speakers we'll really be able to you know connect you with other speakers and other uh, uh, people in the ecosystem thank you once yeah. again pa vikan thank you pa sachin pa yeah. nalin pa karan thank you very much for having me thank you uh, sharing my experience and maybe turhatan <laughs> <laughs> no absolutely pa that is the idea of the round table it's a thought leaders forum right so we i want to discuss it can it cannot just be a presentation or a lecture it yeah. has to be a discussion yeah. okay. there we really get a lot of value yeah okay and, thank you for have a good day yes Stay pa, thank you so thank much thank you so much yes so i'm going to now go on to pa karan and uh, karan is here today uh, uh before i actually introduce karan i would like to say that you know there are a handful of people in this world who have global experience truly global experience what i mean is knowing the difference between how different markets are how the different ecosystems of education are because it is different every country is unique in its own way and uh, uh, looking at the ecosystem not just from the you know policy framework and the actors the ministry etc but beyond that it's the other side of it looking at how schools react how students react how teachers feel when they are part of a certain ecosystem this is actually the one point which people don't talk about because everybody looks at industry heavy look at the in, uh, education sector while as the real consumers of the education sector is the student who is going to class and learning something he is the real customer so uh, karan is one of those people who has been involved a lot he has been uh, at the helm of many in- education um, initiatives around the world in fact i will send a, in the group here a linkedin profile of karan so you can see for yourself but without uh, taking too much time off i'd like to get into this chat with karan right away so karan first of all welcome to the education forum yes 
uh, we actually uh, do this once a month sometimes more than once a month and this thought leadership forum is basically designed to get people thinking and talking about issues so we curated with only about 30 to 40 people but the recorded version of this will go on youtube and when it goes on youtube we get something like 200 to 300000 people viewing it over a period of 30 days so uh, this is an opportunity for all of you if you would like to ask any questions to karan during the talk etc please feel free so i'm going to uh, do this in a style of a fireside chat so myself and karan will do this uh, discussion uh, center around a few themes and few topics i'm going to start with some topics of my own i'm sure karan will want to start with them but please feel free uh, all of you to participate in this conversation you can do two things either you can uh, uh, put in the chat box a question which will allow us to then ask to karan or if you want to put your hand up then you come on to the video and then you will be invited to say a few words so with that uh, karan thank you um, would you like to say something first to just give us what is your view of indonesia so far because you know you have context which you can apply and maybe you can enlighten us a little bit about how you see indonesia's education sector well first off thank you sachin for having me and nalan for having me uh, i realized that if i'm going to participate in this round table i also need to get some batik shirts um, <laughs> <laughs> i think my my polo shirts are not going to cut it anymore so that's uh, step one and the, uh, the second thing I would like to say is, you know, I've lived in Indonesia for three years and your country, you know, most people on this uh, round table are Indonesian. Your country has given me and my family so much. Uh, we live in Bali. My children go to the green school. Um, John Hardy founded the school, but I helped him start the school 14 years ago. And now I'm helping to globalize it. And what's very satisfying about that is it's an Indonesian school brand going global. There are really i cannot think of another emerging markets based school brand that can go into developed countries just think about that for a second right you know china has not done this india has not done this brazil has not done this russia has not done this it's actually only indonesia that has a school brand born in indonesia that has the ability to open as we have in new zealand in south africa we will open in the us we will open in europe so that's something I hope that uh, you are proud of. And it's certainly a school that has given me and my children a lot. So I thank you for having such a beautiful and open country. Um, my thoughts on Indonesia, I actually worry. Um, I worry about Indonesia from an education perspective. And I worry about it because it's a very large country with a lot of young people, but it, it is not known to be an exporter of technology or services. And that is the battleground of the future. We live in a fully interconnected world. So you can say that, oh, we'll just develop Indonesia. But as you know, most products, high-end products that you want to buy, like an iPhone or even an Android phone, uh, a pair of Nike sneakers, most things that we consume today, and I'm not including services like Zoom. We're using Zoom right now which is also an imported service right now. So most things we use are imported uh, in various different ways. And if a country is not able to improve its productivity, what will happen is its currency and its value will decline relative to other countries. And this is a systemic and long-term issue. Indonesia is a little bit unique in that it is a large country, right? You've got 270 million people. Um, but its main two drivers of the economy in terms of foreign exchange are extraction, so oil and gas, palm oil, coal, and then hospitality. And the problem with these two industries are neither of them are extreme wealth generators. They don't make a lot of people a lot of money. And it's suitable if you're a small country like the United Arab Emirates, right? Like Dubai or Abu Dhabi, right? They can extract oil and gas. They can sell tourism. And their people can live very well and be quite wealthy and be quite competitive on the, goal, on the global stage. But a large country like Indonesia, it needs to move beyond extraction and hospitality to start exporting technology and services, because this is where the greatest value add is in the world. You know, today, as you know, the market capitalization of Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and Google 
just these four companies is greater than the rest of the Fortune 100 combined. That is the power of technology as a value add. And when you are living, and it used to be, by the way, there were many years when the most valuable company in the world was would be an oil and gas company like Exxon Mobil or British Petroleum. Those days are gone. Those days are long gone and they're never coming back. Yeah. Today, value add is defined by innovation and technology. And I worry about Indonesia because if you were looking to support 30 million people with great tourism and extraction, Indonesia could continue to grow into being a middle-income country and maybe even a high-income country. But with 270 million people, and a lot of them very young, you have two things. One is you have too many people to lift uh, living standards on the back of extraction and hospitality. And the second is you have a clock, which is when you have young people, you give them enough time and they turn into old people. And the last thing you want is a lot of young people who feel that their lives, their lives were not what they wanted them to be. And now it's too late. This is a, a recipe for social unrest, for a massive economic cost where you have an aging population that's no longer productive and you have to support them. And educating people takes time. You can't really start with somebody who's 46 years old and say, okay, now I want you to become a developer or whatever. It's tough. You can do it when the person's 18 or 20, 25. Yeah. But it gets harder as life goes on. People assume other responsibilities. As you get older, you get sick more often. You don't have as much energy. So uh, when it comes to Indonesia, I think you have an extraordinary country full of potential, full of hope, um, a contributor to not just the ASEAN region, but the world. Mm -hmm. But I believe that you are on a clock. And if we do not, if Indonesia does not consciously go on the path of becoming a services and technology exporter, um, then 10, 15 years from now, there will be structural issues that will be much more expensive to solve and may not be solvable without great cost and sacrifice. So I, I wish I could come on here and only share uh, pure optimism with you. I like doing that when I can. Um, but, but in this case, I'm leading with my heart and I have learned to love your country and I would like it to succeed. And hence, this is the message I wish to share with you. So Karan, very well put, actually. You know, uh, optimism is good as long as you have a foundation for actually achieving it. Otherwise, it remains in the clouds all the time, right? So coming to the key point that you raised, do you see uh, there are other countries alongside Indonesia which are facing the same thing? Is there kind of a benchmark that Indonesia is going through what, let's say two, three other places are going through right now? Well, you know, let's let's do the, let's go through big countries together. It's not hard. Yeah. The United States is in its own league. Let's take them out. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Russia is a bit unique in that it's already quite wealthy. And the, on a per cap basis, it's, you know, it's, it's like a lower, it's like an upper middle income country today. So it's okay. It's kind of in its own, let's take it out. And it, it exports a lot of technology, right? So that's its own world. Mm -hmm. China has taken off and whatever happens now, they have achieved what we call, you know, escape velocity. They are, whatever happens to them, they're going to be all right. They, they have their own internal economy now that's so large that they can literally fuel it themselves if they need to. Um, India, while it has its issues, is an exporter of technology services. Some of the biggest tech companies in the world, Wipro, TCS, Infosys, are based in India. And some of the biggest Western companies like Microsoft or even Apple now have huge development centers in India. Um, and India also exports you know, technology goods as well as services. So India has a base for that. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil has a massive tech industry. It has Embraer, which is one of the world's five largest avionics and aerospace companies. Brazil even has a space industry. Part of the International Space Station has been built by yeah. Brazil. Yeah. So Brazil also has a base on which to be a services exporter. Brazil is also a bit unique in that it's a huge country and it has 200 million people, but it's huge. So like Brazil even if it was going to go on agro exports, which is a big deal for an extraction, Brazil could go further than Indonesia, but then it has a tech base. 
Indonesia is next. If you look at size of countries, and there we go, we're at Indonesia at 270, you're actually ahead of Brazil, but we don't have that platform. You know, if you think about big countries um, that are in a similar place, Bangladesh would be an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to say it, Pakistan would be an example, 170 million people, but not a lot of uh, value at exports and tech exports. Yeah. Um, you know, and these are not great countries to be clubbed in with. Yeah. You, 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 you know, so that's, that's why I worry. Those are countries. Now, Bangladesh has managed to turn things around. Mm -hmm. They are actually somehow pulling it off to their credit. They've managed to turn things around by really taking over and textile exports from India. Um, and they've begun to go into services exports as well. But, you know, it took them a while and there, there were decades of languishing and social unrest and government change. And I mean, it was horrible. And, and of course, Pakistan, we know, is a perennial, like, hand grenade on the planet. Like, I mean, it's not even because I'm Indian. It's just, it, it is a country that worries everyone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's why when I think about big countries, right, I'm not talking about, you know, Lithuania, right? You know, Lithuania can be wealthy by just exporting ISP and server hosting space. You know, like, there's so few people, it's so small, it doesn't matter. Yeah. There's no point comparing yourself to Estonia or Lithuania or Serbia. I mean, like, let's not go there. Yeah. You're a big country and you gotta, you gotta look at what other big countries are doing, wrong yeah. or right, yeah. to lift their people. Yeah. And, and Indonesia, when I look at these other countries, you are blessed with natural resources. You are blessed more than other countries in some way, big countries. But the place that is like a huge gap is this production of technology and services. So I'm going to ask you something that's worth a million dollars. Uh, how do you up the game? What's your view of what are the things that, that should be happening here? Uh, maybe some of it you see, maybe some of it you don't see. But basically, well, what's the blueprint that you know people should think about? Well, quite frankly, I'm going to say something that will probably cause a lot of controversy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I believe that Indonesian tech companies that are exporting production of technology should be taxed because what they are doing when they import those services is they're not paying tax on it, right? So if I hire someone in Bangalore or Vietnam to produce code for me, and then overnight, they just ship it back to me through the cloud. Unlike if I'm importing a shoe or a handbag, I pay import tax on that shoe and that handbag. But I don't see anyone paying import tax on, on that code. I think Indonesian companies, just like Indonesia has tariffs on shoes, on uh, cars, right? If you want to get a motorbike over 250 cc, the taxes go completely crazy. You know, just like you have tariffs for those things. Quite frankly, Indonesia should lift its tariffs on motorbikes because it doesn't matter anymore. That battle has been fought and nobody cares anymore. Nobody cares who makes motorbikes. It's, it's not enough value add to matter. You should lift your tariffs on handbags and motorbikes, and you should shift your emphasis on, on domestic code production and support. This, is, this should be the ground zero of that battle. Hmm. Very well put, actually. You know that actually these are the kind of radical thinking that's needed. You know, sometimes it triggers an action if you get it out there. Uh, what about uh, human resources? How do you see that being playing a big factor here? And what can we be done about it? Yeah. One of the nice things about technology is it means many different things, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, most people don't think of it that way, but I'm going to give you uh, some interest, some maybe, in, you know, uh, not frivolous examples, but provocative examples. Mm -hmm. Spectacles are technology. Yeah. The wheel is technology. I mean, technology means a lot of things. Technology doesn't have to mean that you are developing artificial intelligence driving systems for Tesla. Yeah. You know, we don't have to go all the way there yeah. because to go there, we need the infrastructure of universities that can teach postdoctoral programs in all kinds of new machine learning, right? And, and we're not there yet. Indonesia is not going to be there for 20, 30 years. So let's not go there. But there's a lot of work that needs to happen in, in debugging programs, in modifying user interfaces, you know, so just like in manufacturing, to manufacture a hammer 
Mm -hmm. is very different from manufacturing uh, a component on a satellite that goes into space. The same is true of technology. You know, modifying a user interface or, or creating scalable websites is infinitely simpler than writing that cutting edge artificial intelligence code for an autonomous car. And so we don't need, if we are aiming for this entry level of technology, we don't need to put kids through four years or eight years of university. We need three months, four months, five months of an intensive program where we are offering young people a structured opportunity to learn these skills, but then mm -hmm. a vehicle by which to get employed or sell these skills, if not in Indonesia, somewhere in the world. And by the way, this is not impossible. Another big country that has adapted to this is Nigeria. Nigeria is a big extraction uh, a country, 200 million people. And they have a company in Nigeria. I'm gonna send a link on this chat. In fact, this company is about to go public on the NASDAQ. And all this company does is take Nigerian tech talent and sell it around the world. They train brilliant kids in Nigeria mm -hmm. and they literally then retail their talents in Silicon Valley and everybody wins. Those kids have income and salaries that they could never achieve back in Lagos. And uh, the development cost relative to Silicon Valley is cheaper than even in India. So, there are so many innovative ways to do this. And if Nigeria can do it, if Ghana can do it, Indonesia can do it. So, you know, Karan, who, who should be the prime actors in this entire uh, way of restructuring this uh, sector, right? Uh, there is a government as a player. Of course, they have a certain role. Uh, there are private sector players. There are, uh, I would say, foundations. There are education companies and that's, then that's the industry because at the end of the day the consumer of all these people is the industry itself how do you see the interplay between these various organizations what's your you gotta plan? you gotta make it good for everybody so a great way to do it is what the uk has done the uk mm -hmm. has something called the apprenticeship scheme so every british company with i think more than 20 employees and a turnover of x i forget what it is has to pay at a education levy, okay? I think it's 1% of profit. I don't know if it's some number. It's not huge, but it's there. It's there. Yeah. And they're told that, look, you will pay this levy, but you can use it for yourself. So instead of paying it to me, whatever the levy is, 10,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds, 2 million pounds, doesn't matter. They say you will pay it to the government or you can use it yourself. Now the company then goes, well, What's the point of giving it to, to you? I'll use it, right? Yeah. And then, then there are a number of programs which meet certain government criteria in terms of their quality and what they teach. And, and they can just tell their employees, look, buddy, you know, I want you to do this program. Or they can do it the other way. They can tell employees, sign up for whichever one of these programs you want. And what the, what the employer then does is says that if you do program A and B, then you qualify for promotion C. You know, so, so in other words, in the and UK, it's... companies are actually becoming structured around the apprenticeship scheme and how it is ranking and sorting programs. I love this scheme. There are other schemes like the German schemes, and, but those are, they're, they're, those schemes are harder to replicate. I mean, Germany is the gold standard, but it's hard to replicate because there's so many cultural aspects to it that have been built over the centuries to make it work. The UK scheme has been put in in the last few years and it's working brilliantly. So you know, it doesn't require intergenerational linkages and understandings of how, you know, how a guild, like, a, you know, in Germany, literally the old guilds, employers, universities, like how they all link together. It gets so complicated. But the UK scheme is like plug and play. Got it. So, you know, Karan, you've been living in Bali and uh, in the green school and I'm, I'm sure that that's given you an opportunity to understand Indonesia and the diversity of Indonesia is the 34 provinces and further broken down into Kabupatens, etc. So you can imagine that, you know, there won't be a one shoe fits all kind of a approach uh, in a country like this with so much diversity, so much, I would say, ethnic differentiation, languages, etc. 
And you've seen this in a few other countries, like India is a bit similar as well. What do you think uh, should be the approach um, that we as a community of educators, you know, be it from various backgrounds, what, what, is there something that we should be looking at that we may not have looked at now? Because you know, you've, seen, you've seen this as a helicopter view across other places, right? So any in, thoughts on that probably? In large um, multicultural, multilinguistic federal countries, and, and the US is not multilinguistic, but it meets the other criteria. The key is competition. Yeah. The key is competition. And the, the case study of that in, in is actually comes from India and it's the private university in India. Mm -hmm. For a long time, you know, private higher education was frowned upon in India, even as the government institutions were rubbish, like no working yeah. toilets. I mean, just a total mess. I mean, of course, they were always the IITs right at the top, but most of them were just rubbish. But then one Indian state, Haryana, decided to legalize the private university. And it was great. The university, it was the first one was called Amity. It took off the beautiful campus and it was a tax paying institution in the state. It employed lots of people. They built huge dormitories, a hospital, a shopping mall. And they were like, wow, it's like the whole town has come up out of nothing. And, and as the state, I've had to put in zero dollars. I've had to fund this to the extent of zero. And instead, the university is employing people and paying taxes to me. They were like, this ain't bad. Hmm. And then the neighboring state, you know, uh, went for it. And then it spread throughout North India. So Punjab, Gujarat, Mar now Maharashtra has it. It's going to spread into South India as well. It's just a matter of time. So I would say that instead of looking at the 34 provinces of Indonesia as a disadvantage, I would say it could be an advantage. Why not find one province that's willing to take that step and create something beautiful? And the other provinces will go, I want it too. I want the tax income. I want the employment. I want the infrastructure. I want it all. And the beauty of education is it, give it, it can give it to you. It can literally create, you can create a whole city out of nothing by just allowing a university to exist. It's an, it's an incredible thing. You don't get that. You know, if you say, I want a coal mine here, you don't get a balanced city. You don't get a whole ecosystem of innovation. You don't get, you don't get that out of a coal mine. You don't get that out of a hotel. You get that out of a university. Fantastic. You know, actually, that's a good model to... Emulate. If we put together a case study, that's a convincing uh, approach that we can talk about here. In fact, I think we should take this up uh, at another roundtable specifically to talk about you know such kind of models. So, current coming back to this, you know, I'm going to give you a K-12 question. Uh, you know, your experience with the Green School. I'm sure before you got into Green School, you would have studied a lot about what is the Green School and its system of education. And I'm sure you would have studied what are the other. Uh, schools, uh, the, you know, the, the public schools, the private schools in Indonesia, the SDA, SMP, SMI, etc. Some thoughts on uh, anything that you notice there that could be of interest to people who are school owners and who might look at, want to look at things differently? The main thing I would say about schools is, um, I mean, aside from location, 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 which also applies yeah. to restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. That's right. Is um, different strokes for different folks. You know, yeah. for everyone on this call who has two kids, or three kids or more kids, what you will know is that it doesn't matter that they come from the same parents, they live in the same house. Sometimes you look at these two kids and you're like, really? How can they both be mine? Right? You know, like... <laughs> what what happened here? Why why is one like this and one like that? What's going on? So I think almost I think everybody on this call who has two and more kids will go. Yep, I, I I get that. I got two kids, and you know I'm like whoa. Um, and this is I'm saying this anecdotally, but the evidence will show you um, that that having different pathways of education for children is is massively productive that some kids will learn in more experimental and progressive learning environments like green school and some kids actually love being in a very structured academic environment i would say my daughter is in the latter quite frankly i think yeah. green school is okay for her 
but it's not really challenging. And she just knocks the schooling out of the park. She I means like for her, it's like pff, it doesn't, you know, it's like 10 minutes a day of thinking and she's done. For my son, I think green school's probably much more right for him. He's a, he's the kind of guy that he literally likes to get his hands dirty in the mud, and green school's got a lot of mud. You know, he 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 likes that sort of thing. He likes climbing trees, he likes, you know finding snakes he likes that stuff and green school's like the champ at that stuff mm -hmm. and so my advice is is that think of segmentation think of how within your school you can offer streams that cater to different needs some schools some of you may already be offering for example a national curriculum and igcse that's a form of streaming already to expand your market what i'm saying is is that you can stream even in not just what you're teaching but how you're teaching and all it will do is expand your market. It increases complexity operationally, no doubt, but this is a solvable problem. You know, those are solvable problems with some scheduling and some planning, you can deal with it. What's interesting is the ability to expand your market from that same footprint that you have now. Sure. So Karan, a last question before we end. Uh, some thoughts on the pandemic and how it has affected schools around the world. Are there, uh, I, I would say there's a large part of the story that's very similar, right, across markets. But do you see any interesting uh, viewpoints or opinions or something you'd like to share on how it's going? I mean, so is it is it working, not working, kids like it, anything, whatever you have been hearing in the grapevine? There was a study done by the Gates Foundation in the U.S. looking at public schools. And, you know, in the U.S., as you know, um, each state and each district could make its own decision about whether to stay open or close. Hmm. And what this did is it created a, a great laboratory where some districts have been open almost throughout and some districts have been shut almost throughout. Yeah. And it's, it's, so you can do a lot of interesting statistical work using the US data set and the, the Gates Foundation did this. And what they found is that for schools that were fully online versus hybrid or in person, mm -hmm. that the efficacy of learning was something like 40% lower. Wow. And, um, but on the plus side, what they found is hybrid and in person had almost no difference. Oh, really? So, so, so it was a really interesting and it's a statistically significant data set. It's not anecdotal. It's a beautifully done study by the Gates Foundation. I would encourage you to look it up. So what it is telling us is that, you know, hybrid is the way of the future, not fully online, probably not fully in person either. Um, but, you know, it, the study also included data on fatigue, Zoom fatigue. It mm -hmm. included data on children feeling more depressed, more alone. It also included data on how uh, children uh, are more victims of online predators. Yeah. So, you know, this whole world of online and hybrid, it's easy to get excited about it, but we should also be aware of what we are exposing our children to online and how we don't yet know how to deal with it, right? So. In the offline world, we've developed social conventions and safety mechanisms to protect our children from predators and from unwanted influences. The online world, the internet was only made public in 1996. Yeah. And so in this online world, we do not yet have the technologies and social conventions yeah. to protect our children. We mm -hmm. don't really fully know what it does to a person if they spend half their waking hours on a screen. We don't really know that yet. Yeah. So I would say that, that um, we can be cautiously excited about a change in how schooling is done, but we must keep one eye on um, exposing our children too much to a, a world we don't really understand because if we hurt them, you can't come back. You know, you only get to be a kid once. So we screw this up and a generation suffers. So let's get it right. Given that these kids have already suffered because of the pandemic. Fantastic, Karan. And I think that's about the time we have. 
uh, thank you very much for spending the time with us. The education forum is, uh, you know, enriched by your presence here. And we'd definitely like to invite you in a few months. Uh, the, we have a different format that we're planning to come up with. It's like a panel discussion. Uh, we're going to try that out in November. And uh, we'd definitely like to have you on board in one of the panel discussions that we'll be having in November. Thank so you thanks, for having uh, me here. And, and I, I, I'm very pleased to, you know, I hope to meet more of you either hopefully in person, <laughs> but at least online. And if anyone, you know, if anyone who has a question, you know, Sachin has my email, I'm happy to correspond with you. Um, I'm genuinely sure. passionate about education and I just want to be of help. Yeah, this round table is also hybrid, you know, Karan, because the origins of this round table is it has helped in, held in uh, President Habibi's library. You've okay. been there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that is where all these round tables used to be held. We started well, there and we had to shift <laughs> to Zoom because of the pandemic. <laughs> well, inshallah, we'll be back in the library soon. That's right. Thank you so okay. much, Karan. And with that, uh, going you. to now, uh, anybody needs contacts with uh, Karan, you can reach out to us uh, or on the uh, Education Forum WhatsApp group and uh, we'll share them with you. Karan can also be found on LinkedIn. So I'll share the LinkedIn link uh, into this group later. Okay, thanks a lot, Karan. And Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye, bye. So I'm going to now uh, move on to the next topic. Uh, we are on schedule right now. Uh, today's a little bit of a long session because uh, we have not had a roundtable last month. There were too many things happening at the ministry and it was very busy. They were launching Campus Merdeka and all the programs were going on. And I think people are having more time uh, this month. So I'm going to invite uh, Franciscus Leonardus. Uh, is Franz, are you here? Yes. Pastor Hi, Franz. How are you, How are you doing? I'm fine, Pa. How are you, Pastor? <laughs> I'm very good. Nice so, to see you again, Pa. <laughs> yes, good, good. So I'm going to give some context to what Franz is talking about. Uh, Intel has been the partner of uh, the Education Forum right from the very beginning. Uh, it contributed a fantastic group of speakers. We've had speakers from all over the world. Uh, from various offices of Intel participating different times. This time we are honored to have Franz with us from the Indonesia office. And why it's relevant is because some of the things they're doing in Indonesia is very unique. Some of the services and solutions they're presenting is also very unique. And I would like to be able to uh, hear a little bit from Franz on some of the innovative solutions that Intel is doing. Uh, it has a very, very impactful because, you know, this is what Karan told us and Pa Dirjan also told us today that the influence of technology, even in the way we learn, is tremendous. And it's going to play a very big role in how we develop a hybrid learning system around us. So, Franz, over to you. I think you have a presentation, so you can <clears throat> share slides yourself. And after you finish your presentation, we'll have a Q&A. <clears throat> Franz, I think you are on mute. Hey, Pastor Sim, can you see myself? <clears throat> Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pastor Sim. So actually, yes, uh, when you say Unix, it's always in terms of bringing a Unix for the education, right? Uh, that's when this morning also, I mean, this afternoon, pa, we can also say about that uh, how the education is related to the industry, right? So I think, uh, I don't know how this is uh, related to what is Intel will be present uh, this uh, afternoon, right? Uh, if you see that's uh, about how the developing innovation solution for education here, this Intel is just showing about how we create uh, devices for the students. But what is, what is the a step on that one, whether uh, that one is created uh, in general, whether created by specification, whether it created by the function, that's that's what is Intel is come up with that uh, thinking and solution. So here uh, to give the thinking, uh, to give the idea to that uh, the education, how uh, we are doing in other countries as well, including how we Intel is doing this developing in a better solution for education, right? So the first one is uh, I will bring about the solution uh, based engineering, and the second one is about the typical product development process, like what I doing uh, related to industrial. Uh, the third one is about usability and user experiences, and next is understanding requirement, use cases, and the users model, and then the last one is about the end-to-end -end solution, device and ecosystem, right? 
and then all this agenda is from the through the eyes of students right so about the first what is uh passing is fine technology set technology is actually the source or the central uh, gravity or of the sustainability and digital experiences if you see here when we create a devices so when we create the uh, product or something for education right what is intel sees on that part right? the first is uh, we create for the enhanced and monitor connection so meaning here whatever we create we need to have that survey we need to ensure that the that we create for the education itself right specific for education and then we also see that we need to see that the, the product or the devices we create for education need to be have meet the needs tomorrow users not for now right what is made tomorrow we need to see we need to ensure the user experiences is there uh, the devices can be used for the users and also for the next uh, uses of these devices and also uh, to ensure make a digital and natural as physical right so when we moving from uh, digit uh, physical to digital we need to ensure also what is that devices also can be uh, used not only used as only in technology but when you don't need the technology then the, that's uh, the device is not used right so this is how the technology is part of it from the usability and user experiences from Intel itself right okay so here it just uh, highlight you so when when integrated that development process it, this is related to the industry right when we created one or device one of the needs from uh, for the students what is the process here if you see the first one is about ideation ideation meaning we need to explore about idea generations so when we create that product we create that uh, devices right we need to explore for what is needed, right? What is the fill out narrative exploring ideas? We need to create a presentation for a steering committee as well, right? And then after we create the ideas, and the next one is about definitions. How we define that product for the features, how we define that product is usable for the users, for the student as well. And then we're moving the prototyping, right? We then we're moving the prototyping. Then we move to the detail design, also the validation testing. Then the sixth one is the commercialization. So this is the high level view from the Intel side, how we measure that uh, the devices or the product or the technologies is used for the student as well, right? Here, okay, here I just want to show you about how Intel carry the study or the, uh, the studies uh, for the survey. The first one is about the textbooks. When we ask to the student, how you see the textbooks, right? So now they said, I'm not carrying the textbook to the school or the college, right? Then you said, okay, I I, I still bring that, but uh, I use the photocopy of the textbook. Or oh, the third one is that, or oh, I need to make suggest uh, for annotation, the importation section. So just a bit of that uh, books that they see or they uh, reading about the textbook itself. And then the second one about the notes, right? How that uh, the student created the notes for them, right? So most of the student is taking a note in the class, right? After the class, they sometimes they not even uh, read that one or just maybe in the in the few hours uh, from that uh, student's uh, uh, lectures also. And then uh, the third one is about uh, primary for few, right? This is uh, other reuse. And about the exams. So the exam is uh, syllabus centric and then scan for previous exam paper and then cross-referencing. This is for the exam. And then for the research, they doing a project and presentation like what I'm doing right now. This is also student doing for the project. This now is like COVID. They're using an online class, right? They're doing a project and presentation. And then they try to search the technologies or try the information from the internet in the starting point. And then the information and privatization, right? And then how about the usability and user experiences here? First, when we're doing that of the survey, the first one, the device is, we see this is we need to have dual screen from factor, right? And then also the battery life, of course, this is used 24 by seven of the students. So we need to ensure the battery life is there. When they need it, they just open it and they can use their devices, right? And then the software itself, this is an important part of that devices right the first one the software is with the usability i will explain a bit about the usability 
and that uh, the local language also now most of that uh, software is created by the English version. Why we not creating by Indonesian version? Why we not creating by local language in Indonesian? And then the second one is content creation. This is the important part, right? Because when we created the devices, we created the product, we created the devices. So we need to have the content there. What is the right content for the student? It's not the right content for the businesses. It's not right content for the others. The question is about how we create the content creation for the students, right? And the third one is about the concern. It's concern here, uh, of course, this is the technology. There's a software, there's virus, data safety, stability, the health, use duration, distraction, safety, rather fitness, and weight also. That's a part of the devices that we need to meet the criteria based on the survey with the, with the students. So here, uh, what in the summary, right? In the summary here, we see that the student is uh, using the textbook. Uh, but they don't have, they don't carry that one to the college. They just uh, read it only at, at home, right? The second one, sometimes they not even have that uh, book. So they just uh, buy one book and then copy to the other's book, right? This is what I doing before when I call it also, right? And then the third one is what they doing is just an annotation from that uh, important part of the textbook. And then they just meaning which one is really for the examination, right? So this is the summary of finding uh, the current practices. Again, about the researchers. So from all these things, what is Intel doing best for the survey with the students? The first one is about the use of the laptop, right? The first one is assimilation. So the student use the laptop as a medium to view the presentation and given by the teachers. And the second one for the individual and group assistance, the student extended the use of the laptop to do a research, right? And the second one is about the creation, meaning here the computers are good for making the need formal project, formatting, uh, spell checking, and everything, right? And then the second one, most of students mainly use only Microsoft Office to for education, like PowerPoint, what we're doing right now, the wording and the other uh, software also for the tools of the offices. And then uh, for the collaboration here, it's about emails, uh, join forums, uh, meeting like what we're doing right now. There's extra curricular activities. All this one is uh, made in the collaboration. Again, uh, the most important part here also beside the three is also the entertainment, right? So when they have the devices, the computer, I love the primary for entertainment, it was for the education purpose. So still the entertainment for the education. And then the second one, student store and share movie or uh, music within the students. And most of the students are part of the social networking group, right? They have the Facebook, they have the other uh, social uh, software as well, right? Okay, so here in the summary, what is uh, Intel sees from the prototype and the student also from the book form factor, right? So when we see that survey, we need to create one of the devices one of the laptop, one of that uh, product that meet the requirement. The first one uh, is about advantages, right? The first one, the product need to be size, uh, weight, and profitability. Uh, once, and then the second one is, uh, of course, one stop for all the education need. And then this can be used for all, not only that, uh, the grades, right? And also the, about the long-term credibility. But, there is a disadvantage also, right? Uh, but the black and white screen also bought it on the secondary screen is too small for an on, on-site keyboard because this is a small keyboard there and not comfortable with the idea of sitting screen to view because uh, the screen is very small and move between screen to another screen is it, not easy as well, right? The concern also, like still again, the viruses, uh, the battery life because uh, to create the devices need to have the battery life at least uh, meet the requirement uh, for the students. And then uh, touch screen, of course, uh, now touch screen is the one that technology needs to be there. The safety, uh, of uh, this is the most important thing. Like this, uh, and then the scratch proof, right? So what is uh, Intel see from this here, right? The students need a use model. So this is what we define based on the model on the survey uh, from industrial for the education, right? Uh, that's a dual form factors, uh, dual screen. There's we created that one based on the textbook. So it looks like the textbook, but now in digitalization, right? 
and see here they can do the same thing when they doing non uh, digital they do a thing a book they can do annotation they can boot read they can change a book as much as they can uh, have in that existing uh, non digital books right they can move out all to the digital book right so this is how intel sees from the uh, non digital to digital uh, learning as well again uh, this is about what i said before what is inside that one right what is the content the content is the most important here the part that right? if you see here the middle is the students right? the students have uh, some of the needed the first is about the content itself right and then the second one is teachers there's a parent of course and then the devices and the school administration so all these five components is supporting the student to make sure they can learning and also at digital they're supporting uh, their needs right the first one is about the content itself right so what is the content so when we get the device we need also to include it in the content as well like a book retailers a free content for the books uh, text from the textbook publishers from the newspaper from magazine all the software need to be included as a content store right that's the first one and the second one is about the device itself, right? So the device is we need to create a device specifically with OEMs. We need to create a device specially for the uh, students, right? And then uh, related to the school administration, of course, they need to have like now uh, from the Indonesian government, they they giving us the for the network providers access, right? So they're giving some money to change for the network providers from the SP so they can download it. Uh, from the internet, what the student needed for that uh, devices and also the device they choose for the student itself, right? So this is uh, what is a part of this. Intel is not only thinking about the device, but also thinking about the content. What is the right content for the student in that device? How the related between the teachers and parents, and school administration, how uh, all this content is supporting the students in terms of the learning process, right? This is what is uh, the ecosystem that Intel is already built. And this is what the idea we can bring also for the Indonesian as well. Okay, from that is what is the, what is the look like the devices, right? The first one is uh, need to have a dual screen LCD, right? Because it's like a unique form factor devices, like I said before, we created the unique devices for the students not for the businesses, not for the others, but the unique form factor from the uh, for the students. So we create the dual screen. It's like a textbook. So it's look like a textbook, but now it's on the laptop versions, right? The second one, they, they don't they don't need to carry the printed book, right? Because everything is already moved out to this uh, to these devices, and also there's online uh, books like I said before. The content is there can be downloaded directly from the uh, these books. They have an access from the books they need to know they need they can read and they can do whatever they can do in the existing uh, books without digitalization and now they're moving to digitalization itself right and the third one is about they don't need to create a new multimedia textbook solution right because now a lot of solution in the different area right uh, they need to read a book then they need to find another devices they need to create a presentation they need to use a laptop they need uh, other thing for the uh, music school or uh, for the school they need also the another devices right so this is uh, one uh, solution for the student to do all this related to the student itself and then uh, this is solution is to monitor quality and the services right what is meaning here when the device is created the device is need to be theirs it's need to exactly for the students based on the survey that Intel are doing, and then for the features use, it can be also used based on what the student needed, right? So this is what is we are doing in other country. We're doing a survey, of course, in Indonesia, it can be different, it cannot be 100% the same, but at least Intel get idea how we bring these uh, devices or the design for the student, and especially only for the Indonesian students uh, that will be carrying, moving forward from, non-textbook to the textbook, also to digitalization. Okay, this is uh, just a look like, right? So when I said, uh, what is the device look like, right? This is a uh, devices, it's like, uh, the bigger is like a books, 
uh, the thing is like a book itself. It's a uh, inside is dual screen, so it's same with the books. Uh, it's left and right, and do uh, like a book also. And this is uh, simple, and also it can uh, the thickness, thickness, uh, the chrome there. This is the design what is in that created, right? Yeah, again, this is uh, just the highlight or the summary here. So when uh, we're doing that or the process, right? We're doing, enter doing that process from the idea session to the commercialization, right? The first, we need to ensure that uh, the usability uh, heuristic or the usability of function. The first one is about the feasibility of the systems. And then the second one is consistency and standardization, right? So this is the consistency or the standardization for the students. And then, uh, of course, this is a recognition rather than the recall, right? And then there's a recognition match the system and the reward. This is, of course, we're doing the survey. So we need to measure that the system is match is the real world use case. And uh, user control and freedom, of course, they can do it uh, with their laptop or with their devices. If I cannot say that laptop, the devices. Uh, and then the flexibility is there, and then they can help and then documentation, right? So all this component is, we can see that this is a summary from the finding or the idea, the survey, we do a creation and until that's so the finalization of the session. Okay, I think this is uh, from Intel. Uh, this is just giving the idea. Uh, it's not say that Intel or Intel is giving or should uh, uh, so tell you that okay, this is your device that need for Indonesia. No, this is just how the way we doing uh, based on the finding in other country. Of course, I said that this is can be different with Indonesian, but at least uh, the thinking or the process how we doing this device for the student <coughs> is already prepared on that one, and we need to create based on Indonesian devices. Okay, I think Pasasin, thank so, you for the time. That's from me. Pak Frans, very interesting. You know, yeah. uh, though your presentation is a bit technical, I think it, there is a lot of information there which is useful. Uh, you know, one of the questions I have for you was, uh, like you mentioned that uh, you have, um, uh, how do I put it, uh, got a lot of insight from other countries and you're looking at how you will look at Indonesia soon. Yeah. What is your view? I mean, say, what, what is the way you would like... Uh, this kind of uh, innovative solutions to go into Indonesia. What is the way to do it? Is it through private sector? Is it through Intel's partners? How how is it going to go into the market? Thank you, Pastor. I think that's a great question, Pastor. So so for sure, Intel is not doing by Intel itself, right? That's for sure, yeah. right? Uh, the first the first one we need to tackle the ecosystem, right? Intel need to have the ecosystem. Ecosystem yeah. here is not only the devices or not only the hardware, not only the design, but also how we measure all the component, all the 360 component there, right? From the devices, from the software, the content also, how to bring the devices to the to the student, right? And like now we're yeah. working with the Orbit, right? Orbit have the students, have the uh, learning and the student and there's a curriculum, how to bring this, this uh, standardization to the education. So this is how we do it. And uh, of course, with this session or the next session, we working with that orbit as well to ensure yeah. that the Indonesian have this kind of the devices, design, device or the product that's suitable for the student itself. Yeah. So, so Franz, Franz, if you could just take the screen share off, can you put off your screen share? Okay. Yeah. We are still on share screen, yeah. Okay, I'm not fine with the media. Just, uh, yeah. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, you. Uh, a, a couple of questions um, on this. Uh, do you see the K 12 sector or the university sector as your area that you want to get in? Okay, thanks, Pasif. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, when we're doing a survey, when we're doing that, design for the uh, what you call this uh, product or the devices right mm -hmm. we need also to working with the university because the university is the one that can be uh, placed for this uh, survey itself right 
and also the idea not only the survival idea they can give the idea what is to look like uh, who what is the better uh, devices for indonesia like i said this is uh, for other country might be different with indonesia so uh, there's input from the university uh, yeah. itself and then uh, we have you work with the university as well now we work with some university but of course we open for other university of, uh, to work with intel uh, yeah. to have the devices and also how we created this for indonesian student devices hmm. so uh, in uh, other countries uh, you know the devices have to be affordable that is one criteria yes and uh, easy to service because yes. uh, uh how do i put it easy to service because you know there may be some broken children carry laptop or they yes. saying they are more tend to be damaged they drop it it falls down yes. or maybe not stored properly etc so that's one aspect also uh, uh, you know the easy to use operating system that's another thing that becomes important yes. so i th- i think you know these are the factors uh, which indonesia needs a device that's going to be inexpensive at very cheap yes. what are your thoughts on that i mean are there any devices in the market today that are really priced affordable for students uh from the price point of view is is based on what i see now mm. is based on what is the devices the existing devices so yeah. they use actually they use not for the students that's that that's what is see right now they use for the general mm. then they they just uh, get from this uh, from the student right so of course yeah. from the price point of view is we be use the general pricing point of view right mm-hmm. because it's not a uh, student and the second one is about the user itself right yeah. when you said the uh, the operating system the easy to use and how they use it right yeah. when we get that one uh, when we bring that one from the general to the student they just fill up they just uh, download it whatever the software they need right it yeah. cannot control that one but with this uh, with this uh, new devices because we are doing this through pay We are already uh, working with the con- uh, content center, with the con- uh, content creator. So we know what is they need to uh, download it to that software, and we created the software based on what they need. Like right? a textbook. Right now, I am not see that uh, the software is uh, is like a textbook, and the laptop is just one screen with the <coughs> monitor. Right? It's not like even a textbook. With that idea, we can create like a textbook and also the device only for the student is there because. Yeah. Uh, the software is already downloaded, right? Because uh, now you know Indonesia is like uh, the islands, right? Country, right? There's yeah. uh, not not all the students have the access to the internet, right? That's yeah. the reality. So how to make sure that the software or that uh, the content is ready uh, delivered to the student and already downloaded into their laptop or the devices? That's what is interesting from that one position. Perfectly clear, my friend. So if if we can request you at the next roundtable. If you are able to, you know, share uh, devices for education, uh, yes, specific yes. Um, maybe a showcase of products that you have, etc. That would be very interesting because we are looking at a different theme at the next roundtable where we also bring schools, we bring students, you know, that kind of uh, ecosystem into a discussion. Yes. So looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Papa Franz. That was a very Thank interesting you. presentation, and uh, we're going to move to the next topic now. Thank you, Papa Franz. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Jim. <coughs> So um, well, we have the last thirty minutes of the roundtable uh, today, but uh, this is, in my view, the one of the most interesting parts of the roundtable because it leaves us with what to think about for the next one month. And uh, my good friend uh, Nalin Singh has been uh, doing this segment in the education forum for the last, I would say, more than a year. <clears throat> the focus has to be. Uh, looking at education issues slightly from a different perspective why is this important because you know we are in the industry we are in the system we are doing things in education and sometimes we get blinded by what we do and we don't look at it from an outside perspective or a helicopter view we are so busy with what's happening in the jungle or in the we are still in the trees we don't step outside to see what's happening in you know the bigger picture story so this is something that nalin has done very well he he forces us to think he forces us to address some uh, basic issues sometimes controversial sometimes you know uh, i would say provocative sometimes i think makes you relook at what you're thinking yourself but that's the whole idea it's food for thought and it's going to provoke our thinking and we're going to leave you for the next 30 minutes with a presentation and a discussion with nalin so over to you nalin 
Thank you, Sachin. Well, everybody take a deep breath. I won't take much time, 15 minutes maybe. But a lot of us think that uh, EduTech is something new. The first online course in the world was launched in 1986, 35 years ago. If you look at the latest technologies that are being spoken about today, blockchain, it was invented in 1991, 30 years ago. You take it uh, to look at uh, crypto exchanges, Bitcoin, that was 2008, 13 years ago. The point I'm trying to make is that every technology trend that we think of and look at takes time to mature. And EduTech has taken 35 years. The pandemic has made it accelerated. What has been the impact? COVID pandemic has had a huge impact, right? One and a half billion children out of school, one fourth of humanity. But for the edutech sector, it was a lottery. Markets boomed, the whole sector boomed. Their growth rates have gone up, their adoption has gone up. But the point Karan was making, it has led to students for the first time in their life, being excited to go back to school. <laughs> All of us are feeling what the children go through every day. We have sat through this uh, round table for two hours. Children have been going through this every day, six hours a day, complete fatigue. We pay too much attention to the technology part of education. EduTech also has education in front. Education is much more than schooling and schooling is much more than curriculum. EduTech companies concentrate on an incestuous relationship with manufacturers of devices and continuously talking of the technology part of it, which to my mind is supposed to be just an enabler. It's not supposed to be the end all. So we've seen this huge online fatigue. We have seen digital divide go up dramatically. And we have seen what Karan was saying that students are anxious, sad, lonely, financially set back, or have had to relocate because parents relocated because of their jobs going away. All this is playing on a generation of students. If you think of learning, where research says that most children finish 60 to 70% of the learning in the first eight or 10 years of their life. If you take two or two years out of that, 20% is gone. When Sachin said you should speak about what the Indonesia edutech sector should do, I started looking at what is the nearest comparable country doing? So I looked at India. I haven't looked at India educates, education edutech sector for a long time because I live in Jakarta. And I was shocked to see this advertisement. This is their latest advertisement. This is a company that is the first unicorn in the edutech sector in India just like Ruanguru and does tuitions, online tuitions. And believe me, tutoring is not edutech. They have an, an advertisement now that says, if your child takes up tuitions, we will give him two teachers in the same class. And that ends with a tagline saying, this is the future of education. Absolutely not, it's a joke. Think, every stakeholder loses in this. Parents pay schools, to teach their children for six to eight hours of a day, and then they have to pay for a tutor as well. Children go to school six to eight hours a day, come back home and they have to be tortured again. And now two teachers to torture that one child. How stupid is this? Is this what EduTech is supposed to be? Is this what value add they're doing? I hope Indonesian EduTech sector never goes into this direction. So what all is there in the future of education? That whole host of things to do. And this is a very active and busy slide, but it covers a lot of things from tools, technology, to softer aspects, to how children should be treated. And I, I'm always delighted when I hear the MOEC and Mora here speak about teaching to children compassion, empathy, life skills, character, things like that. Everybody has a view. Some people say that children will go to class but the educator will become digital. Some say no, the student will become digital, the teacher will go to class. Some people take it a step further. 
they say the educator will become a robot or become a holographic image. All this only scares me. It only scares me and I'm very ha glad and uh, happy that my children have passed education phase and they're already 20 years plus and they don't have to go through this kind of confusion. If this is edutech, what are we putting our children through? Let's look at the global education sector. Each one of these small boxes is a subsector in that. And there are totally 40 boxes. Indonesian edutech sector has not even touched five, six boxes out of this. And there's not a single company from Indonesia in this global landscape. If you look at the 90 odd companies that are supposed to be changing the edutech sector in the world or changing education in the world, again, we are not present there. And what you will notice is a point Karan was making. Innovation is happening outside of Asia. The three largest populous, um, three of the uh, most populous countries in the world, China, India, and Indonesia don't figure in this list. Innovation is happening in some other culture. Delivery is happening from some other culture. Student is living somewhere else. Would you trust your children into such an ecosystem? Would you like your children to be taught in such a, such a manner by it, some technology developed for some culture delivered by somebody else? And of course, EdTech is accelerating. Pandemic has given them a lottery ticket. They're growing leaps and bounds. They will double, triple by 2025. The subsectors of education and EdTech on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, you have the impact, and on the x-axis, you have the maturity models. The sectors of the future are pretty obvious over here. It is going to be largely in the technology space. But the sector is yet to mature, and what edu edutech companies right now are doing, I believe, is something that is leading to a huge dissatisfaction. If you see the right-hand side graph, there's a huge gap between what consumer expects and what they are getting currently. Let's look at Southeast Asia before we look at Indonesia. Again, Southeast Asia, 50 top edutech companies. We just about make it with one company in it, which is also a tutoring company. Some of them have offices here, but they're not Indonesia born. Even in ASEAN, the sector is going to go, grow even faster than globally. 22% CAGR per year. And the pandemic has had a huge positive impact. The Indonesian edutech sector out of the 40 sectors, sub-sectors you saw in globally is present only in seven or eight. Right now, what they're doing, like a lot of other companies, even in places like India, et cetera, they are basically digitizing what is already there. They're taking the classroom cur curriculum, putting a video, or making a nice graphic out of it. They're taking a, dis a societal dysfunction of poor quality teachers and providing tutoring. There is no innovation. There is no edu tech. Simple tech is being used to educate. It is being used for scalability. It doesn't mean it is wrong. It doesn't mean it should not be done. But to Karan's point, if you don't innovate from within, you won't have a good enough sector or a sector that you can be proud of or a sector that is built for the Indonesian culture and mindset. And to reinforce my point, edutech is not tutoring. Tutoring is basically scavenging of a societal dysfunction. Does that mean we should not have edtech? Absolutely not. We must have edtech. Edtech is here to stay. EdTech will contribute, but don't have your expectations high that it's going to transform your world or your child's world in the next one or two years. It's not going to happen, at least not in Indonesia as yet. We heard Pavikan say as well as Sachin say that we are the fourth largest market for education in the world, and we should invest in technology here much more. If you see this round pie chart, it is a telling graphic. The actual purchase of edutech services in Indonesia, average is 70% of the people spend less than 300,000 rupiah. So it's a very low price point kind of thing that's going on right now. And if you look at how 
the next comparable country like India has gone, most of the ed tech companies are selling the same courses of universities and trying to sell it online. So that is one of the key trends. While ed tech is growing, while pandemic has accelerated it, the challenges remain. Quality remains a key challenge and even educator quality. How can we say that the teachers who teach in the classrooms don't do a good enough job, but suddenly in the evening when they come on Ruanguru, they start doing a good job? How is it possible? How can the same manpower suddenly become better? Or how can having two such teachers make it better? What are you trying to tell me? One teacher is not good enough? Or one teacher needs to be corrected by another one? Or are students so dumb that you need two people to pound the brain of one child? Challenges remain, but the opportunities are huge. Opportunities for all of us are huge, but what should they be doing? And one area of opportunity that, that you take companies are not concentrating enough is as we see automation across the world, Indonesia is one of those countries which will have more than 70% of the jobs at risk. And the pandemic has accelerated that. What are we going to do with these people? Forget children. If these people don't have jobs, they won't send their children to school. What should we do, be doing? So I have three suggestions that I talk about. Number one, the whole game is about skilling up. You need to stop doing tutoring as much and stop recreating content that the unit, curriculum that is already available and stop digitizing the class, uh, classroom textbooks and concentrate on what takes a little bit more effort, but qualitatively changes the life and the skills and the quality of manpower of the country, which is killing the existing workforce reskilling, skilling, etc. If you look at Indonesia in agriculture, industry and services, it's, it's a huge gap. I can show you umpteen slides, which will reinforce this point that Indonesia, there's a huge gap of the quality of manpower and managerial manpower. This particular slide is about managerial manpower and talent. Second thing which edutech companies need to do is to start working with the government more, especially when you have such a proactive ministry right now. I, work, I have seen and worked with many countries. I haven't seen a more proactive ministry of education anywhere in the world right now. And ed tech companies need to work with them. Our own experience has been hugely positive. And my last slide is all ed tech companies, and this is a point that Karan made as well, need to go to outcome-based user experience. Just like any other user experience, you need to bring children onto the platforms and decide what can be taught online, what needs hybrid, what needs in-person, what needs hands-on project-based, what needs do as you learn. People learn by doing, not by listening and watching. Every degree should have a def definitive outcome. And people, ed tech companies should concentrate on who is teaching and how it's taught versus trying to take the same curriculum, digitizing it and saying, wow, we become ed tech. That's not ed tech. I will leave you with that thought and stop screen share and take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Nalin. Uh, good presentation as always. I had a couple of questions. Uh, I have a couple of things that have come to me on WhatsApp as well. So uh, do you make a distinction between education, getting an education versus being trained for getting a job? Is there a difference that one should think about? Yeah, so that is what I meant when I said education is much more than schooling. There is an element of knowing the technical aspects of how to do a job. But there is an element of how you perform at the job, which has got various, many more things, right? Your listening skills, your communication skills, your, your you know, empathy, things like leadership skills. These need to be embedded in courses right from the start. So for example, even though we teach artificial intelligence, apart from teaching AI, we gift wrap it with programs that have all these life skills or human skills. I don't like to call them soft skills because these skills are very hard to learn. I don't know why we call them soft skills. They should be called human skills 
or life skills. And these should be embedded in every program. The technical skill that you learn and degree that you get will help you get, open the door for a job, but it won't help you retain the job. It won't help you grow. It won't help you become a boss, a leader, a manager, a CEO. That's a good point you make, actually. So, you know, this all these changes in curriculum, changes in methodology for teaching, all that has to take into account all of these things, right? So it boils down to at the end of the day, how do you engage students and make it interesting and, you know, motivating them to learn? Because, you know, it is uh, going to school is a different experience for every child. Absolutely. They go for different reasons. School, you learn companionship, sports, and so many other skills. And that is why this whole focus to say that now everything is online. Uh, I completely di disagree with that methodology. Today, because technology, etc., uh, changes so fast, uh, every two years, three years, you have different technologies. It is important to teach people, uh, every learner, we need to teach them how to learn. How do you constantly upskill yourself how do you constantly learn from our various sources? How, why should you constantly invest in yourself and your career by relearning? When we learned, you and I, we learned and we, we assumed that that skill and knowledge will help us throughout our life. So I'm 52 now. I finished my education when I was 22, 23. For 30 years, it has held good. Today, it doesn't hold good. You get out of college three years later, what you learned is redundant. So you need to teach people how to learn and constantly relearn. That framework is more important than teaching them one degree. It won't help them. Today, college students know that degree is useless. You step out of college, it's useless. They need to learn how to learn. They need to learn all the other skills. So there's a question actually in the chat box here, Dalit, for you, which says, where to start first? Uh, should it be developing apps, train the teacher, how to teach with the existing technology, or is there any other option? What is the starting point? Excellent <laughs> question. The one thing is that, you know, we all have suggestions and everybody knows what to do. But the sheer scale of the problem, the diversity and the time it will take makes it very difficult. So, for example, if all these changes will take 10 years, then three, four generations of the workforce would have missed the bus. Yeah. So I don't think it is about apps, et cetera, et cetera. I think technology should be used only as an enabler to scale. Uh, so for example, technology allows you today to have your best teachers live stream into various classrooms. But what can they live stream? They can only live stream part of the curriculum. You still need the local teacher to connect, answer questions, handle projects, connect to industry, uh, do all of that part of it. So I think uh, technology should be used just to enable a core minimum standard. And on that you build. Instead of constantly telling teachers that you need to learn the curriculum better, maybe you can standardize the curriculum and deliver it in one way. This is how, how I like to put it. I believe there are four aspects to, it, to learning. <clears throat> the what questions, the how questions, the why questions, and what if questions. The what questions are information. Google knows it better. Every child on their phone has more knowledge than the teacher. That's why the teachers feel incompetent sometimes. So that part of it should be done by technology. Once you, once you know what, what something is and you want to know how does it work, then you need 90% data dump, 10% Q&A, where teachers value add comes into play. Third, you come to why. You know what this is, you know how it is works. Now you want to know why does it work the way it works and why is it important? There it is a 50-50 of classroom uh, project work and 50% of information. And finally, when they have learned the what, how and why, they need to practice the what if scenarios. What if they, I change this? What if this happens? That you can learn only through internship, on the job training, etc. <clears throat> so the starting point should be get the common denominator, which takes 80% of the time, that heavy curriculum, which has to have 500 hours of teaching, etc. Take that part of it, standardize it, digitize it, put assessments to see if people have done it or not, and put the value add part of it with the teacher. Teachers will be respected again. Otherwise, right now, students know more than the teacher in the classroom because they're busy doing the what questions. 
No, you make a good point actually. Uh, I have a follow up question actually on the same train of thought. You know, the pandemic has created a huge digital divide, which has become even further divided, right? What is the way out of this? Or how do you see it playing out in the next two years? Could you repeat that? I was reading something on the chat, so I missed it. Yeah, no, the digital divide. We are talking more about the fact that people are being deprived of, or they don't have equal access to devices or internet or various things. So the digital divide has actually become worse. And it's becoming even more highlighted today compared to two years ago when it was not so important because schools were able to step in in the gap. Where see, do you see this playing out? See, it is politically right to say there should be no digital divide. But where is divide not there in which part of society and which industry? When we were studying, it was a divide of rich and poor. Then it became a divide of caste, creed, etc. Then it became a divide of private school versus government school. Then it became divide of IGSC global curriculum versus local curriculum. Now it has become digital divide. This will always exist. Indonesia is large enough with such a large ecosystem that what it really needs is one segment of cream uh, hmm. showcase students, showcase uh, teachers to show the way. Trying to Now the government is trying to uplift everybody, but that, that may take too long and too slow. It is like saying we will remove poverty from everybody, we'll remove hunger from everybody, we'll make everybody a happy citizen. These things are a good goal, but is it going to happen in your my life lifetime? For that, should we let the intelligent and the ones who have access to also slow down and not learn? So yes, we will take everybody along and we'll pull them along, but uh, we have to concentrate on small pockets of excellence. In countries like Indonesia, where uh, you know you mentioned this, <clears throat> uh, internet access becomes a huge challenge. Are there any other ways of addressing it where you don't, well, let's say internet access is not good enough, but is there any offline, like for example, is there any le lesson from 20 years ago which could be applied again? It's a matter of prioritization. Yeah, like using digital disks in, or whatever. In Indonesia is a three times per capita richer country than India. Okay. But in India, every time this question comes, the question is, do people need Wi-Fi or they need food, uh, shelter and clothing? Yeah. If basics of food, shelter and clothing are not met, what will they do with Wi-Fi, mobile phones, etc.? So, it, so these are the kind of things that, you know, uh, governments and politicians grapple with, which I don't envy them. They have a very tough job. But uh, ideally, yes, everybody should have access. And if you look at the way uh, today uh, digital access is there, I would arg argue that it is the pace of digital access has been faster than the pace at which we removed poverty, hunger, and homelessness. So yes, it is happening. It is happening faster. Maybe we are getting, because of the instant gen gratification generation of Instagram, maybe our expectation is too high. But if you look at the pace at which the other social problems are solved, <coughs> the pace at which digitization and education problem is being solved is much faster. Hmm. Okay, got it. So I have a question now moving towards jobs. Okay, we finished the skills part of it. Now we get a little bit more real. Uh, this is a big challenge actually at many levels. Uh, there's one question in the chat box and there's, I have another question coming to you on uh, matching jobs with the industry. But you know, you remember pa we can earlier today had said about one of the la larger parts of his focus is on linking to the industry. And uh, he also mentioned that it's not just big industry, but he's looking at even mid sector and small scales and including new startups, which is one area where uh, a new startup can exist anywhere, absolutely anywhere, because if they don't have business, they can start a business versus industry having to already be there and have to be successful for steady jobs and people to be, you know, having some predictability on the jobs. Well, a startups doesn't give you that. It's the biggest risk. You may have a job today and not have it after three months, right? So in that kind of a world uh, where uh, jobs are being created or at least temporary jobs are being created or not with the respective job security that comes with it, etc. How do you juxtaposition this situation with Indonesia and what's happening here? So I think Indonesia has been lucky in some aspects. Because technology framework, etc. and large tech industries are not there, 
some of the job losses that have happened in countries like india etc because of changing technology and automation has not yet come here that fast for example 10 years ago in india the call center industry employed 1 and 1/2 million people yeah all those jobs are gone all got automated or shifted to philippines that has not happened large scale here so if in a crazy way you may say that has helped but with advanced automation robotics etc coming in the two big sectors extraction and automobile they will see that and the problem will not be just of skilling up uh, the young people but reskilling the workforce that is going to leave that because if they lose their jobs they're not going to put their children in school uh, we'll have a different kind of social problem that is where i think the government should will is already doing it but will incentivize Uh, private players to come in and uh, fill that gap because those are short term courses they are short term things uh, it's already there in the advanced economies right the company gives you a workforce and says reskill them from this to this and we will have a job for them or we we can place them elsewhere those kinds of things will take off in a big way i think the campus merdeka program is an absolutely brilliant uh, start uh, i have heard a lot of things and Uh, about feedback oh it's not good enough not going fast enough hey it started believe me 99% of the countries don't even have a program like this it started it is a huge leap there will be teething issues but uh, the sheer scale quality and the intent behind this it, it is absolutely brilliant and i think it will pay results in the, uh, two three years time by then people may forget who and who, how it started it will be taken for granted Well thank you Nalin that's just about enough time that we have we are at close to 5:30 uh, we would like to finish on time i'd like to actually you know end this <coughs> discussion with a um, uh, couple of points that Nalin made and food for thought it is definitely because you know these are the issues that everybody should think about and um, if you have any follow up questions or if you have any topics that you'd like to contribute feel free to send us a message uh, or you uh, if you you know the rsvp number of this particular uh, round table you can uh, send your details there and ask ogi our person in charge to connect you to the whatsapp group so there is a whatsapp group of people who are thought leaders in education you are free to be part of that group uh, because we will share some of the decks that were presented today in that group and uh, we look forward to actually having you at the next round table which is uh, uh, i think few weeks from now uh, we are planning to do uh, two round tables a month for october november and december uh, because uh, there have been a lot of different topics suggested to us and uh, to do one a month sometimes you lose the timing because the issues are very important and need to be addressed Uh, in a shorter period so we're looking at about another 5 to 6 uh, round tables before the end of the year so please stay tuned and be part of the whatsapp group so that you can be informed about when is the next round table if you have any other inputs to us or if you have any other uh, information you'd like to put in the chat box please do so uh, i will uh, share ogi's number in the chat box as well so don't log out till you have got that number yeah i think it's just been posted so Uh, you can get in touch with her and please make sure that you're part of the community who are interested in thought leadership uh, do remember that this is in english for a reason because we have a lot of global participants we have a lot of global speakers so we don't do this round table series in bahasa indonesia but in bahasa indonesia we have a separate event we have a different event which is done in bahasa indonesia if you have a preference for bahasa indonesia event you could let ogi know we'll invite you to those events which are held in bahasa and uh, you, you could look forward to you know uh, the links to this video in a few days in a couple of days we'll have the link of to the video out uh, on our uh, 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 website and youtube channels and then you'll be able to you know follow up on that so with that i'd like to thank everybody thank you for joining us it's been a two and a half hour session and like nalin said now you know what students feel like when they sit the whole day in front of a screen we have also gone through a similar experience of a long session I wish you a good evening and uh, enjoy the rest of the week and wish you all the best in all your endeavors and your uh, businesses that you are involved in. Thank you very much. Look forward to be in touch soon.
Thank you, Pak Sajin, Pak Nalin. It's very great, excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Pak. Pak Gogot, uh, we want to actually have you uh, on uh, uh, the next roundtable. And uh, I saw some of the work that is being done related to uh, Korea and a few other areas. And there's some common topics on innovation that we'd like to talk about. So I'll contact no you separately on that. Pak. I'll be very happy to invite uh, my colleague from Korea also, if you yes, don't mind. definitely. Uh, if you could suggest a good uh, speaker from there, uh, we'll weave it into the next roundtable. We'll find a suitable date and we'll announce to everyone. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Pak Sachin. Thank you, Pa. Have a good day. Yes. You too, Pa. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Sachin. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sachin, for inviting. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. I, sorry, I was not able to, you know, uh, have a chat with you separately, but I. Uh, we, you know, there's something that I'd like you to be speaking on as well. Uh, yeah. Why don't we uh, connect on WhatsApp later and figure out the topic because you do a lot of work between India, and Indonesia and the education yeah. space. So why don't we have a chat about that? Sure, sure, Sachin. Sure. And uh, yeah. we can, we, you know, we can um, uh, slot you in for one of the roundtables that's coming up. Sure, no worries. We'll be more than happy to do that. Thanks yeah, a thanks lot. <laughs> Have a good evening and a good week too. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. -bye.